Welcome to the Night365 Outreach. Hello. My play small group, men's, women's, and children's group. Saturday, November 19th from 5 to 8 p.m. Meal with small group for Meal with small group for Baba. This is the um, marriage um, small group, but it's definitely open to singles. Anyone that wants to participate will definitely get something out of it. Jesus Followers Bible Study begins Tuesday, November 1st at 7 p.m. this Tuesday. Books available on Amazon. Thanksgiving dinner open to all. That will be the 24th at 5 p.m. Cairo, Ohio, Ohio at the Vineyard House. Vineyard Ryan, Ryan, did you ever actually just a message of somebody in the room? Yeah. We are collecting for the Voice of Hope Pregnancy and Family Center. If you would like to donate, we have a pink baby bottle. <coughs> and the band may come up for worship. Praise the Lord. <laughs> I heard on TV uh, that Israel's elections are Tuesday, and I they are asking they're asking for people to pray and fast tonight through Tuesday for Israel's election. The have a very progressive um, group in there right now, and they are praying for it to be overturned. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. <coughs> Bill was reminding us this morning that we're seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. <coughs> we have a heavenly seat that is above all places, and so. Let's praise the Lord for he's opened the door for us to walk in true authority. Let's pray. We thank you, Father, for this blessed evening to gather in your name. We thank you, Lord, that you're here in our midst. Lord, you're with us even to the end of the age. You have a glorious plan for your people. Lord God, help us to be in, in line with your will and your way and be ready to go out in your name proclaiming your name boldly. Lord, receive these offerings from our lips right now, Lord God. May they be a sweet-smelling savor to you. And Lord, may you inhabit them. May we leave this place renewed and empowered in your spirit. Lord, as we hear your word, as Ryan speaks, may your anointing be upon him, Lord God, and may the word go forth mightily. We'll give you the praise in Jesus' name.
Amen. Praise his name. Praise the Lord.
Jesus, these people are hungry, man. They've been following you for five hours, man. We came across the lake. They followed and ran. They're here. They don't have any provisions. Uh, we got to feed them. Why didn't Jesus say, you know what? I'm going to let their hunger. I'm going to let this be a teaching lesson on spiritual things here. We're going to teach them about hunger. We're going to teach them about resisting yourself, about denying yourself. We're going to teach them about infliction. We're going to teach them about hungering after Spiritual things, righteousness. No, he didn't. He provided. A, he, he provided sustenance, food for them. He wasn't given a spiritual lesson, but there's lessons we're going to learn out of this. So I'm going to read this. Now, this story is so important. It's the only miracle, or it's the only story outside the Bible that is in all four Gospels, besides the um, crucifixion, resurrection miracle. This is the only other story that's in all four Gospels. So there's something here that, that's uh, of importance. Chapter 6, verse 1. After this, Jesus went to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. And a large crowd was following him because they saw the signs that he was doing on the sick. <laughs> Jesus went up on the mountain, and there he sat down with his disciples. Now the Passover, the feast of the Jews, was at hand. <laughs> Lifting up his eyes, lifting up his eyes then and seeing that a large crowd was coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, where are we to buy bread so that these people may eat? He said to test him, for he himself knew what he would do. 
Philip answered him, 200 denarii would not buy enough bread for each of them to get a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There is a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish. But what are they for so many? Jesus said, Have the people sit down. Now there was much grass in this place, so that the men sat down, about 5,000 in number. Jesus then took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated. So also the fish, as much as they wanted. And when they had eaten their fill, he told his disciples, Gather up the leftover fragments, that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up and filled 12 baskets with fragments from the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten. When the people saw the sign that he had done, they said, This indeed is the prophet who is to come into the world. Perceiving then that they uh, perceiving then that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, Jesus withdrew again to the mountain by himself. Let us pray. Father, help us to glean truths from your word, Lord, so that we can live them out to your glory. We can live them out through your power. We can bring these stories to other people and show them what you were all about, Lord, and show them why you decided to do these things and for who? Us, unworthy wretches. Thank you for your grace, your long suffering. I I, I need your long suffering and mercy, Lord, every day. Thank you for all you lavish upon us, even the lavishes we don't even know that you're doing. We give you all glory and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. So, uh, it's getting pretty bad out there, right? Diesel shortage, what? Isn't our food already expensive enough? I heard that there's a diesel shortage in our country. We're like, uh, have like a 25 day supply left. You know, there's people uh, in other countries that they have no fuel source or anything, so now they're reverting back to wood. You know, people are stealing wood now that they have put GPS tracking devices into the lumber and the heating wood because people are stealing it. Imagine getting shot because you're trying to warm your house and feed your family. And they come and find a GPS in your in the wood in your fireplace and they shoot you. That's the, the day we're living in. It, it, it's a mess out there. And it's like the, the, the currents of the rapid. It seems like it's getting stronger and stronger and stronger until we're at that precipice. And we're about to go over the edge. But those who have faith in Christ don't have to worry about going over the edge. Amen. They don't have to worry about... The launch codes uh, being turned and the missiles being fired. This ain't our home. Blow it up. We've got a kingdom uh, far away. Hey, well, what about the kids? What about this? What about that? They live good lives. <laughs> They've seen it enough. But here's the thing. you got to be ready. I told you about the guy who would come into the prisons and he would greet every prisoner there. Are you rapture ready? Now, whether you believe that theology or not, he was saying, are you ready to meet God? And that's what everyone in this room needs to ask themselves. Am I ready to meet God? Or when I say, no, you know, I got a few things I got to get in order. I remember when me and Rachel were first dating and uh, I still had acne and stuff. I remember she was coming over and uh, I was like, how do I hide this? Am I ready to meet Rachel? She's coming over. (laughs) Am I ready? Uh, I, I found one of my brother's nice shirts I got on. Wait a second. It's too tight. I find something that fits. And I remember trying to cover my pimples up. And I remember, you know, Banaka. You were a mess. I was a mess. Thank you. But I wasn't ready for Rachel to come. But uh, you got to ask yourself, are you ready for the, that, that's an earthly woman who is in need of salvation, who is in the same boat everybody else is, lost without Christ. Imagine the king himself has a spot for you to stand before him, or to kneel? Are you ready to be there? Are you going to be sweating bullets? You don't. Are, are you going to be uncertain? People say, you really can't know until that day. That's a lie. You can know. Jesus said, you believe in me, you put your faith in me, you trust in me. Even though you die, you will live. Do you believe this? Because some people don't believe it. But, You can be certain that you'll be greeted with a well done, my faithful servant. And if you don't get that greeting, there's no, okay, I wasn't ready yet. Let me go back 
give me 25 more years. Let me go back and get ready. Because you go back, you're not going to get ready. Because the devil's going to come in your ear again and say, did he really say <laughs> you weren't good enough? So as we go through these Gospels, as we're looking at people's encounters, remember that we also have a Gospel to proclaim and to bring an encounter of Christ to people. And people will reject it or embrace it. A little is a lot when God is involved. So these people ate so much bread and so much fish that they were full, that they were getting toothpicks out, that they were resting back on there and, and they were good. Why didn't he just say, uh, you know what? There's a lesson here. I can fill you because you're going to be hungry again, y'all. Jesus could have said that. You guys are going to be hungry again. And I know some of you are going to follow me, so I feed you again. But that's not why you need to be following me. He could have said, there's a spiritual hunger that can only be satisfied by me. But God shows here a little is a lot when God is involved. Did you guys hear me read that story? There was a little lad there. Right? Did you see what he came with? He came dragging this huge fish net with him. And the fish were flopping everywhere. And his buddy was with him with a giant wheelbarrow full of loaves of bread. And they had all this fish. And he says, here you go, Jesus. Feed everybody. That wasn't what happened. There's people out there, uh, liberal theology. Back in the 18th century, it was really started coming alive. You know, Thomas Jefferson, like, took his Bible and cut all the miracles out. He says, no, this is make-believe. This doesn't happen. You can't have supernatural things. So Thomas Jefferson cut all the miracles and all the supernatural out of his Bible. So that was the Bible he read. He didn't believe in supernatural. Well, if you don't believe in supernatural, you don't believe in raising from the dead and living spiritually forever because that's supernatural. You don't believe in the cross and the resurrection because that's supernatural. I don't know. There's a lot of books on him, though. I'm sure you can find out. Let me know then. But there's people. So in the 1800s, 1900s, you got these schools that are have these liberal uh, professors and stuff. Do you know? First off, here's what we can learn from. We're going to talk about what we can learn from Jesus feeding the 5,000. So some of the things they try to dismiss this miracle. All the miracles Jesus ever did, all the supernatural stuff Jesus did, and the, all the stuff in the Bible, people have said, this is what happened. I told you about the burning bush in the wilderness that God spoke to Moses through. Liberal theologians have said this was a natural gas leak that was causing the bush to be not consumed and burning. Jericho, wall of Jericho coming down. They said that was impossible with the shofar. All, even if they had a million shofar horns and the type of uh, mortar they used, it would have taken this many decibels to knock down the wall of Jericho. Okay, well, they're forgetting that. We're talking about God's knocking a wall down. He doesn't need anybody's help. So now every miracle they've, they've shot down. And this is what the devil does. Did he really do that? Did he really do that? That's why they say, no, they didn't really do that. You can't do that. That was a natural gas leak. So they've said that the people, when they saw this little kid come up, and he's like one of them poor homeless kids with the little hat on. And he says, extra, extra, read all about it. That's what I always picture this kid. Coming up with the pegged up pants and a hat on and a newspaper. Get your newspaper. This Justin. But he had these barley loaves. And he had these fish. And it was all he had. And he says, here, Jesus, I'm giving it to you. And everybody was so struck with compassion for their fellow human being. That they pulled out the food that they actually had but were hiding and not sharing with everybody. And everybody sat down and gave of what they had. And everybody was able to eat out of the compassion that this little kid had for his fellow humanity. So that's one way they try to dismiss this as a miracle. The other one is even more lavish that I read. That there was a cave nearby that Jesus, who was a charlatan and a huckster, and uh, was just doing all these things to gain no notoriety and popularity. He had bread and fish hid in a nearby cave. And he had long flowing robes with which the apostles, who were doing like a bucket brigade from the, ca the cave, 
and we're bringing the bread and the food, could bring it up and Jesus could pass it out through his overly large, like a magician, uh, with nothing up my sleeves. These are the, how outlandish people have got to make an excuse so they can sleep at night and say, no, this isn't real. This is make believe. This is a bunch of people. This is somebody swallowed by a great fish. Come on now. Uh, and you just go on and on and on and on that people try to refute the Bible. And there's going to be people that are so awestruck and dumbfounded on Judgment Day. that They're going to say, wait a second. I was duped. Or I made a big mistake. I followed my own desires and lusts and wanted to only bow to myself. And that's what the world does. When you reject Jesus, you're rejecting salvation. You're rejecting eternal life. And you're embracing unbelief and condemnation. That's what you're clinging to. That's where your future is. That's your, where your eternity resides. Separation, condemnation from God. What can we learn from Jesus feeding the 5,000? Jesus' compassion. I didn't tell you guys to come chase after me. I didn't come. I was rowing a boat. You, you guys didn't have to come running and following me. But they said they came because they saw what he had done in healing the sick. Nobody does that. You can't heal that. You can't put sight back into somebody's eyes. You can't make somebody hear who's deaf. This guy is doing it, and they're falling after him. I don't know how he's doing it, but I want him. I want to be with him. He has something that is not natural, something that is not of this earth, something that I'm drawn to. So Jesus had compassion. This is in all four Gospels. And I think it's Mark who talks about Jesus had compassion on him. It says that because they were like sheep without a shepherd. Okay, I'm not a farmer, but I've heard a lot of dumb things about sheep. So if you had a giant pen full of sheep and there was an open door, I guarantee you all the sheep are not going to come up into a huddle. And go, okay, here's what we're going to do. There's an open door here. We got daylight out there. We can get out. We're all going to file in line so they can't count our numbers. We're all going to go. We're going to go to the woods. Then we're going to all gather together and make another plan of what we're going to do. You know what would happen if there was an opening? There would be one sheep that was dead on the road, hit by a car. There'd be another one caught in a thicket over here in the Jaggers. There'd be one with his head in the fence, went out the wrong door, didn't get the opening. There'd be other ones that are just going in circles. That's what he says. These are like sheep without a shepherd. That's what we are. We're aimless. We have no clue. That's why God came as the shepherd. And he's saying hey, he's providing bread in this story. He's also the bread of life, which came down from heaven. This also figures the manna that came down. They were hungry in the wilderness. And the manna came down, the bread of heaven. And Jesus says, that was me. I was that sustenance you guys ate. And that is the sustenance. But he, his body, his flesh, when we partake of that, is eternal life. So Jesus had compassion. Does anybody know what compassion means? Passion means suffering. C-O-M means to come alongside. Compassion, alongside suffering. That's what Jesus is doing. He's coming alongside suffering. That's what we need to do as believers. We see somebody suffer and we're going to go, that's going to be a financial drain, an emotional drain, a physical drain. It's going to cost me sleep. It's going to cost me plans. I'm not going to deal with that. Too much drama. Okay, there's a lot of times we can have compassion and go alongside somebody that's suffering. But there's a lot of times where we look at it and go, that's going to spend a lot of me to take care of that. And in the natural, it's hard to do that. But when God gives us his spirit, we're more able to Love people who are not very lovable. To come alongside somebody passionately, even if they're a stranger. You know, when you are a, not a believer, you tend to stick to yourself, your family. You know, you'll do things for this and that. It's, it's rare that people will put their life on the line for somebody they don't know. But when you have the Holy Spirit in you, like Jesus' compassion, show me what God looks like. Look at Jesus. God is compassionate. I mean, it's called the, the passion of Christ, the suffering of Christ. 
Christ suffered so that those who were separated from God could be brought alongside God and in fellowship with God and alive by God and to God. And another thing about Jesus, you guys ever seen the mob movies where the mob boss wants to meet you? Well, you don't go into the diner and he's not sitting up at the bar and you go grab a stool. You know, you've got to go to the back room and he's over at a table here. And when you enter the back room, another bodyguard gets up and it brings you back and you sit down with the boss, right? You got an appointment. You don't just show up, slap him on the back and say, hey, let's shoot the breeze for a second. You didn't have to have an appointment with Jesus. You showed up. Hey. We're letting our friend down. I know we didn't call ahead, but we got the thatch removed and we're sending him down. We he, he needs you, Jesus, period. Jesus didn't say, no, you take a number. Get a number, get back in line, and when our number's called, come on up. That's like God. We don't need an appointment to talk to God. We're not going to get a busy signal. We're not going to get an answering machine. We're not going to say, push five if you want to leave a callback number. He's there. He's ever close, personal. You don't need an appointment to see him. These people didn't have an appointment. You go through the Bible, you're not going to see where Jesus says, no, come back later when I'm not busy. I mean, there are people he says stuff to, like the woman about well, the, the, the bread for the Israel. She goes, well, the, the dogs eat the crumbs that fall on the floor. You know, Jesus tries to pull stuff out of people sometimes. But you never need an appointment with Jesus. That's another thing I want you to see. And Jesus uses other people to bless others. So don't be asking for a blessing from God. You will, you live an obedient life to, to God, he's going to bless you. You live a disobedient life to God, you're going to fall under the curses. God's not going to have anything beneficial for you. You're living in disobedience. Disobedience brings not the blessings of God. God doesn't bless disobedience. But you live a life in obedience, God's going to be blessing you. Not so that you can get another house for the winter on the lake, but so that you can bless others. So as you're in the position, wow, look how much God has provided for me. He's always kept my head above water. He's always made the ends meet. It's like the meal, the oil, the woman's oil kept going and going and going. God made that provision. Her faith, our faith, our obedience. But God will use us to bless others. Jesus was using his lad that's like uh, the hands and feet of Jesus. This guy has the food. Jesus is going to bless it and provide for everybody. And we're going to hand it out. That's like what we're supposed to do. Jesus multiplies the blessings in our life. And we're supposed to go out to others, feed the homeless, take care of those uh, who are sick, visit the orphans and widows. However, that looks nowadays in the 21st century. That's what we're supposed to do. Be the hands and feet of Jesus. And another thing you can learn from this 5,000, nothing is too big for God. That lad could have brought a mouse crumb, and it could have been 5 billion people that needed fed. And the same provision would have happened. Nothing is too big for our God. Do you guys remember that? Oh, no, I, I got myself into such a mess now. God, you don't know the evil I've done spiritualize it. The sins that we've committed, people are, are, are trapped in their past, are trapped in their sins, are trapped in their guilt. They say, God, I don't deserve this forgiveness. It's too much. None of us deserve forgiveness. And it's all too much. One sin on the cross was too much for the perfectly holy Savior. Too much that he deserved that. He didn't deserve one sin, let alone the sin of all the world of all times. So don't ever say something is too big for our God. Listen to this. When we say it's impossible, because we do that a lot, there's no cure for this. It's impossible. Jesus says, no, I don't think so. He says, give to me what's troubling you. Step aside and watch what I do. That's what Jesus says. You think it's impossible? I don't think so. Give to me what's troubling you. Step aside and watch what I do. I'm a God that nothing is too big for. In Ephesians 3, it says that to him who is able to do abundantly exceeding, abundant exceedingly, abundantly exceeding, it's so much, it's 
abundant and exceeding together. That is a powerful sandwich. The abundant, exceedingly, beyond all that we can think or imagine. That's what God, can you think of a lot of things, a lot of big things? Think real big. Think super big. Like the biggest thing you could possibly think of that could be for your life. It says that God won't only do it exceedingly, but exceedingly abundantly above all we ask or think. So we don't even have to ask it. He knows. So that's one thing I, I, I can get out of this. Nothing is too big for God. Don't limit God. Don't put God in a box. Don't make God a, a, a little limited power God. Do not be discouraged if you think it is too little. You know, bread, they, they, they were being fed. You know, I'm not going to bother God. This is something insignificant. But like here, feeding these people, they weren't going to die if they went without food that night. They go back home hungry. Maybe you won't faint along the way. You ain't going to die because you missed a meal. So people might say this was a little thing. Feeding these people. But Jesus is in every aspect of your life. Even the little things you think are little. Do you know that he could easily cure AIDS as he could remove a, a splinter from your finger? He equally, everything is equally effortless with God. So what you think is little or big, he says, give to me. Watch this. Have high expectations from God. You know what? It reminds me of the first miracle he did. I don't see Mary going, come here, guys. Whatever Jesus says, just do it. I picture her saying, whatever he tells you, do. She's like, I'm expecting big things. I know he's showing up. Whatever he tells you, do, do it. Mary had high expectations. She knew that Jesus was going to move. And that people are going to be blown away. How did he... No fermentation. What? How do you do this? And there's people who say, well, wine in a cave. He brought it over on chariots. See, people always try to dismiss Christ. <sighs> Come as you are. Give God what you have. This kid did not bring in the big net of fish. And they're wiggling everywhere. And the bloves. He didn't say, I'm going to go get enough to provide for everybody. He came to Jesus with what he had. That's how we come to Jesus. You know how many times I hear people say, I know I got to get back into church. I know I got to quit drinking. I know. Listen, you keep saying that, you're never going to come to Jesus. Come in your dirty, wretched filthiness, because no matter how much you try to clean up, you're still a dirty, wretched, hellbound piece of filth. Spiritually, dead, alienated from God, enemy of God. So come as you are. Whatever sin you're loving or hating or doing or quitting or trying to quit, come as you are in that state of debauchery. Because we're all in that state of debauchery without Christ. Don't go, uh, don't try to fix yourself up. You're, you're bankrupt. Don't put all your Christmas cards. Uh, all your, you don't have money for Christmas gifts. You don't have so, you, don't, you don't have any good in you for salvation. You know that? If you don't have any money for Christmas gifts, you don't have any money for Christmas gifts. Don't go put it on a credit card and go bing, 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 bing. And then take your kids and go, hey, look at all this stuff. I'm sorry that you're not going to be able to eat for three months, but we've got all these toys. Don't say, I'm spiritually bankrupt, but I'm going to quit smoking and drinking and go to church and I'm going to pray five times a day and then I'm going to do this and this and this and then I'm going to come to God in all my beauty and awesomeness and holiness. No. Come to God as you are spiritually broke. Because no matter how much lipstick, deodorant, spiritual deodorant and lipstick you put on, you're still going to be a hellbound wretch without Christ. And that's how everybody meets Christ. It need to be born again. That's why he's there for Nobody shows up to Christ born again and says, I want to be born a third time. No, you're born again once. You don't come to God born again and say, what do you got for me now? You show up to God dead. 
And Jesus says, if you believe in me, if you put your trust in me, that's why I came into the world, that whosoever believes in me shall not perish, but have everlasting life if you don't mess up, you knucklehead. Does it say that part? Or say that all those who believe in me shall have everlasting life. It doesn't say unless you mess up, knucklehead. He came to save, not condemn. Remember that. So have high expectations from God. Does anybody know what the number one marketing word is? The number one word used in marketing. And I do this all the time. I'm at the store. I look around. I go, okay, it's there. I see it there. I see it there. And a lot of times they got it highlighted and uh, in a little corner with different ways to draw your attention to it. Anybody? Any guess? Sale. Wow, I didn't hear any of that. <laughs> what? Sale? What would you say? I said sale. What'd you say? Yeah. Rollback sale. I'll give you a hint. New. New is the number one word used in marketing. And you look around, it'll there's everything will have new on it. And also another uh, often one uses more. New and more. Well, I want you to look at these encounters that people have with Jesus. And I want you to hear the words Jesus said himself. He's come to give you a new life from the dead. Born again from above. Now you have a, he's come to give you a new spiritual life where you had a dead spiritual life. And he's come to give you a life that is more abundant. So there's a lot of, there, there's a new and there's a more with Jesus. And people are going to encounter Jesus, whether it's through your gospel proclamation, whether it's from you bringing them to a church service where they learn, wait a second. There's no way I can get to heaven besides Jesus? Nope. And I have to surrender my life to Jesus? Yep. And then I'll be born again and have eternal life? Yes. Bring somebody. Let them hear the the truth. Let God's truth go out. It says it doesn't come back void. So get the gospel out to people. Let it go in their ears. And and let it spring up like living water as God meets them there. So I'm going to close now. But I want you guys, as you're doing your daily Bible studies or nightly readings, or whatever you're doing, just look at the encounters people have with God. And just look how they come out on the other side. Because not everybody comes out on the other side and touches uh, Jesus' crucifixion wounds, bows down and worships him and says, my Lord, my God. Some people say, eh, I need to see bigger and better. How many people say that? Even if God appeared before them, some people would still deny. All right, the band can come up. I'm going to end in prayer. Lord, what you can do with a little bit of provision. You say even a, a faith the size of a mustard seed, you will multiply and grow to your glory. It's not going to be us watering that seed. It's not going to be us making our own seed of faith grow. It's going to be you. Honoring our faith, no matter how small it is, you're going to honor that faith and grow it and bring it to fruition, Lord. We just give you all the glory and all the praise and all the thanks for the word I'm thinking today, Lord, is long suffering because I am such a spiritual knucklehead, Lord. And if it wasn't for your long suffering with mercy at the end of it, where would I be, Lord? I just thank you for lavishing your grace and mercy upon me and upon all those here, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. The Lord has poured his love on us. So let's pour it back on him. Name of the song.
Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. So uh, praise the Lord with your words, with your deeds. Uh, just living for him out there in this uh, dark world. Bring some light out there, some love out there, and have a great blessed week. Amen. Amen.